All right, this is just a mic test, mic test, mic test. Mic test. No, mic test. <laughs> Can you hear me? Testing one, two, three. All right. <laughs> Hello. How's it going? All right. Did you did you receive the slide deck? You got it. What was that? I got your link. Okay, sounds good. I don't have a chance, or I don't have a, an option, right? <laughs> I don't have a choice. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
His, his, uh, he's been traveling a bunch lately, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah.
unmute my mic. Uh, so really anything where aerial robots would need to ascend to uh, heights that we wouldn't really want to put humans in that situation. They'd be dangerous. Uh, and if, while they're there, they could also uh, repair the structures if they're damaged. Uh, another obvious one is the transportation of packages, whether that's to uh, deliver the packages or even to send the packages maybe from your own house. In order to do that, we need robots that can interact uh, with such things. And I think uh, the last application, which is pretty obvious, um, but I think it's a potentially massive impact, is disaster response, uh, where robots could be used to survey the damage, maybe provide reports for, uh, for first responders so that they know better how to respond to the situations. The robots could be used to deliver needed supplies, maybe act as radio relays in these situations if the communication systems are down, uh, and they have the, the impact to, or the possibility to impact these types of scenarios uh, and to mitigate uh, the issues that arise there. <clears throat> now, I think these applications are really exciting, but there are a number of challenges that we have to tackle before these can become realities. So for example, um, right now, most aerial vehicles require a pilot to be in the loop. And this doesn't work well if you need a robot to be flying large distances, and it also won't scale well if we want large numbers of robots to be actually able to perform these types of tasks. Uh, another, uh, and in order to alleviate that, what we need are robots that are able to operate autonomously. They need to be able to navigate on their own from some point to another, do so while avoiding obstacles, uh, and still perform the tasks that we've specified for them to perform. Now, we also have to be mindful of the fact that these vehicles have limited flight times. Typically, they can only fly for 10 to 30 minutes, depending upon the vehicle, uh, and that's obviously a significant constraint. Uh, another major challenge is if we want robots to be able to interact, maybe uh, deliver packages or repair a structure, we need them to be able to physically interact with their surroundings and be able to manipulate their surroundings, which is a difficult enough task, uh, even for ground robots. And finally, as what we are dealing with is an aerial vehicle, we always have to be mindful of the payload. So this means we have limitations to the computation that we can have on board, uh, as well as the types of manipulators that we can actually carry on the robot. So my research is trying to address that list of challenges uh, by exploring the, the overlap between three, uh, three different domains, and that is aerial robotics, manipulation, and perception. So what we're going to do is, uh, go through a trajectory through this Venn diagram, which captures the progress of my research as well as the talk today quite nicely, where we'll start with aerial robotics, explore some of the overlap with manipulation, and eventually incorporate perception to, uh, to take a step towards truly autonomous vehicles. So let's dive into some of the background and basics of aerial robotics. The platform of choice for us will be a quad rotor. This is a multi-rotor vehicle that is really convenient because it's lightweight, it is agile, it can, it can hover in place, it's mechanically very simple, there are only four uh, direct drive actuators, uh, and for the footprint size can carry a relatively large payload. And uh, so this vehicle we usually model with four, as four thrusts each, uh, for each rotor, and uh, the thrust is proportional to the square of the propeller speed, and uh, there is a moment that counteracts that the direction of the propeller. So two of the propellers spin one direction, and the other two propellers spin the opposite direction. Now this model is equivalent to the one that I picture on the right-hand side of the screen, where we usually consider one uh, single net thrust in the vertical direction, and then three moments, one about each of the principal axes of inertia of the vehicle. Now in almost any application, we want our robots to be mobile. So we'd like them uh, to be able to get from point A to point B, and one of the questions that arises is how do we do that? So for example, say we have a robot on the left-hand side of the screen, and we want it to move to the right-hand side. Well, in order to do that, the robot would first have to rotate slightly to the right, where it would now have some horizontal component of its thrust. It needs to maintain the same vertical component of its thrust, otherwise it would begin to descend, and we wouldn't want that to happen uh, in this scenario it would eventually have to decelerate and come to a stop at the end of the trajectory. And this is really useful to understand how this works, especially for aggressive trajectories where we might want to uh, quickly interact with something. And so we, we end up asking ourselves, 
uh, in order to control these better, what are the thrusts and moments required? What are the control inputs required to execute such a trajectory? Now to understand that, we need to understand the dynamics of our system. So here I've pictured the, uh, the translational dynamics, which are simply defined by Newton's second law, where we have the mass on the left-hand side, we have the acceleration of the robot, we have the net thrust that I talked about, and we have a rotation matrix that defines the orientation of the vehicle. So this is the attitude at any given point in time. And what that does is that allows us to express the direction of that thrust vector. And so here we have a, a third standard basis vector. And then we also have a term to include the, the gravity, the body weight forces uh, on the vehicle. Now the angular dynamics are given by Euler's equations of motion, where we have an inertia matrix, we have the angular acceleration, we have our control inputs, the three moments, as well as some cross terms uh, that exist there. And then the translation and angular dynamics are related through the orientation of the vehicle. Now, there are many control methods available. So if we want to uh, maintain the robot in one position in space, uh, this is the type of approach that we need to consider, is we can determine a thrust, and a net thrust vector, if you will, based on position errors, velocity errors. Uh, we can include terms to compensate for the weight of the vehicle, as well as include terms uh, that we call feed forward terms that consider a nominal or desired acceleration. And in these cases, we can also let the moments uh, have a similar uh, approach where we would have errors in the orientation, errors in the angular velocity, and also include terms to compensate for the dynamics as well as terms to consider the feed forward control that we want to execute. Now one thing that's really nice about this controller is that it's exponentially stable as long as the initial attitude error of the vehicle is less than 90 degrees. All right, so that was a quick overview of uh, a little bit of a background into the aerial robotic system that we will be exploring today. Uh, but I'd like to also consider the overlap now with manipulation. And really this comes into play anytime there is contact involved with a physical object. So there's a number of, of works that explore this domain. For example, we've seen robots that are able to pick up two by fours, uh, maybe pick up building blocks to construct cubic structures. Robots that even can use their own body weight to, act, to actuate a gripper that would allow them to perch. We've seen robots that have multi-degree of freedom arms, uh, as well as aerial robots that can perch on a door and use pneumatic actuators to actually uh, manipulate the handle of the door. Now, in all of these scenarios, the robots are moving relatively slowly when they're interacting with the object that they're uh, physically coming into contact with. So this isn't necessarily um, it, the most exciting, and we'd love to be able to speed this up so that the robot could more quickly interact with uh, whatever it is. So in these examples, uh, you can see the robots are, they're able to do their task, and they, they do a good job of it, but they're not nearly as quick as what you might like. These robots have very quasi-static motions, they're hovering effectively in place when they're coming into contact with the object and, and so forth, and even when they're placing the objects. So I'd like to ask the question, what if we could speed up these interactions? And this brings us into the first domain of my research, uh, which I will call high-speed grasping. Now looking at nature, we can see really cool examples of high-speed grasping. For example, uh, this is a red kite, and we can see it snatching food from the ground. And it's really impressive how it swoops down, it grabs the food, and it moves on. Uh, like, it, it does this all the time. To give you an idea of how fast this is, this will slow down 100 times. Now take a look at this bald eagle, uh, also really impressive. And I think there are some, some several observations that we can actually make from these video clips. So first of all, in this case, the eagle swinging its claws backwards relative to the body of, uh, of the bird. And this, what this does is this allows more time for the claws to actually interact with the object that is grasping. So with this inspiration, we designed a gripper to place on our robot that can actually swing at the hip, if you will, of the robot. And this, however, complicates our dynamics a bit more, and I don't have much time to dive into that. Uh, but the point is that we can consider this in a dynamic model, and, uh, and I'll explain what approach we take to do that. So first of all, we're going to assume it's a planar system, since in general, these types of grasping maneuvers occur in a vertical plane. 
And we're going to model the robot as having a thrust F in the direction of that B3 vector. This is the, the third vector in the body frame of the robot. The pitch of the robot is defined by the angle theta. And we have a moment that can actuate about the axis into the page, uh, and that's M2. And we also have an angle that's defined as the angle of the gripper that's relative to the horizontal. Now, the state vector of our system is a little bit complicated. We include the position of the robot. We have the orientation of the robot. We also have the orientation of the gripper, as well as all of those velocities. And so what we really want to do in this case is plan a trajectory in the state space of the robot, but we also need it to make sure that it satisfies the dynamic constraints of our vehicle. So we're trying to get from some, some initial configuration to some configuration where we might be grasping an object at, uh, while in motion. Now, what's really convenient about this system um, is that it has a property called differential flatness, which means that we can, we can plan trajectories or we can propose, if you will, a set of so-called flat outputs, which provides us with a one-to-one -one mapping between the state space of the robot and trajectories that exist in terms of these decoupled set of flat outputs. And uh, this is really great because then we can plan a trajectory in these decoupled set of flat outputs. And as long as the trajectory is sufficiently smooth or sufficiently differentiable, we can guarantee that we can map it uniquely to a feasible trajectory in the state space of the robot. Another nice feature about this is that it allows us to compute feedforward control inputs that can, we can then use to compensate for the dynamics of the added gripper on our system. All right, so to give you an, an example, because it's a, I think it's a very difficult concept to grasp, um, if, say that we've planned a trajectory in terms of those flat outputs. Uh, if, then if, with just knowledge of our dynamics, we can actually compute directly the thrust required at any point in time based on the acceleration of those flat outputs. We can also compute the orientation of the vehicle without solving any differential equations, simply based on the acceleration of the trajectory. Now we could continue with this analysis, incorporating our derivatives of our flat outputs and the, the dynamics that constrain our system, and we can eventually populate the entire state vector, as well as all of the control inputs for the system, which allows us to, uh, to then consider that when planning the trajectories and also compensate for uh, the dynamics of the gripper. So we can incorporate this onto our robot and uh, achieve the results that I've, I'm displaying in this video, where the robot is uh, able to move and grasp at really high speeds. So we leverage, like I said, the differential flatness property of the system to plan these trajectories, but we can also make sure that the trajectories we've planned are not violating the dynamic constraints of the system. It allows us to grasp objects here at two meters per second and three meters per second, which is actually about nine body lengths per second for the system. All right, so this was really fun. We got to do some really cool work with quick interaction with objects. But I think that there's still a limitation that I haven't really addressed. And that is that we're still limited by flight time. This might impact the rate at which we can interact with objects, but it doesn't solve the problem for persistent operations, where we'd want vehicles to be airborne or stationary for large numbers of time, or large amounts of time. Now, once again, we are inspired by nature, and our research is motivi motivated by the fact that birds such as this eagle are able to perch when they don't need to fly. And same thing for hummingbirds. They burn an incredible amount of power when they're in the air, uh, but they're, most of the time they're not flying. And so with that inspiration, uh, it makes sense for our robots to do the same. Now, perching on level surfaces is an obvious choice. Uh, but in many situations, I would argue that it's not actually practical or ideal for the robot. Consider a city, for example. Most level surfaces are frequented, frequented by dogs, pedestrians, uh, or cars. So you definitely don't want your robot perching there because it's not safe for the robot. Uh, now, conveniently or interestingly, most vertical surfaces would be completely untouched by those types of disturbances. So what we'd like to do is perch on these inclined or vertical surfaces so that the robot can be in a safe place. Now, the idea of perching with aerial vehicles is not novel in and of itself. 
We've seen fixed-wing vehicles that can perch on wires, maybe power lines or something like that. We've seen fixed-wing vehicles that can also perch on vertical walls. There are quadrotors that are able to perch on vertical surfaces, but in this case, the, the robot uses uh, Velcro to adhere, and it also uses iterative learning and, uh, to try to learn where it needs to launch from in order to perch at the desired perch location. We've also seen robots that are able to perch on vertical surfaces, such as windows, uh, using a side-mounted gripper. But unfortunately, that's not ideal for also transporting payloads, which is another one of those uh, tasks that we'd like to do. So I don't have time to dive into the specifics of the gripper that, uh, that we use, but our collaborators at Stanford developed one that allows us to interact with objects, such as the cell phone. We can grasp the cell phone uh, and deliver it anywhere we want, really. Uh, but the gripper is also able to allow our robot to perch on vertical surfaces. Now, so now we're faced with the challenge of planning trajectories that get the robot from some initial configuration to the desired configuration that meets the requirements specified by the gripper. So our, our collaborators said you need to uh, hit the, the surface with these velocities and provided what we call a landing envelope for the gripper. So it's a set of conditions at which we would say the gripper is successful. Now with that in mind, as well as the dynamics of the vehicle, we're able to plan trajectories, uh, once again, leveraging this differential flatness tool that get us from any initial condition to any perch position, any orientation. And what's really great about this work is that unlike previous works exploring similar problems, we don't need to iterate experimentally in order to plan one of these trajectories. We can simply plan it and know that it will be uh, successful. Now, to give you some videos of, of these experiments, we're able to perch here at 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 70 degrees, and even on a completely vertical surface. The angle of the perch can be varied easily, and it doesn't require iteration or switching of controllers, which is what's often sometimes done. Um, and at the end of the day, we're also able to release from the surface when we want. We could also then use the grip, same gripper to transport objects and deliver them. All right, so now our robots can not only interact quickly with objects, but they're also able to perch on surfaces, turn off their motors, and save a whole bunch of energy, allowing them to be much more useful for any sort of persistent operation. However, I'd be a bit remiss if I didn't mention that all of this has happened in a structured laboratory environment where we have a dozen cameras around the room, as well as specified markers on the vehicles to achieve these types of actions. So obviously this isn't applicable or directly applicable for real, real world scenarios. Now, in order to actually make this a reality and bring this into real world situations, we need to incorporate perception into consideration for our vehicles. This, is, this would allow us to put all of the sensors on board the vehicle rather than having external infrastructure or sensors that we rely on. So for now, let's just look at the overlap between aerial robotics and perception. In this domain, we've seen relevant works focusing on navigation, mapping, visual odometry. Uh, but in general, these works focus on localization relative to some starting point, And they're always concerned, or usually concerned, with avoiding obstacles. There's never a, an explicit consideration for interaction directly with an object. So they don't directly apply for what we're trying to do here. Now this brings us to the concept of visual servoing, which is the overlap of manipulation and perception. Now there's two uh, main paradigms in visual servoing, which is concerned specifically with the problem of using vision sensors to move a robot to a certain configuration relative to a target object. These two paradigms are called position-based and image-based visual servoing. With position-based, the feedback for our system is computed from an estimated relative pose between, um, between the robot and the target. The image-based approaches actually compute feedback directly from the differences of images and the, the way that image features differ between a desired and, a, and the actual observed image. Now, I've, I've presented two block diagrams that kind of capture this here. So with the position-based approach, you can see that we are explicitly estimating the pose. We have a pose that is estimated, and from that, we 
uh, put our control on there, and we can then wrap a control loop around that and drive the robot to some configuration. With the image-based approach, there is no pose estimated. We simply have the image features, which are parameterizing what the robot is seeing in the image, and those are directly used in our control law. Now, each has their benefits. For example, the position-based approaches allow you to use standard filters in the MAV literature, while the image-based approaches are often more robust uh, to camera calibration errors. Now, in the field of visual servoing, there's a, uh, a number of excellent tutorials and introductions to this concept. We've seen works covering uh, robustness to calibration errors, uh, works exploring all kinds of visual servoing types of applications, and even works considering maneuvering relative to spherical targets. But most of the works that have been discussed in the past are focused on first order systems or fully actuated systems, which means that they still don't directly apply to our vehicle, which is not a first order system, and it's also under actuated. So if we take a look at the overlap of all three, we start to incorporate the constraints that we need in order to uh, plan these sorts of uh, maneuvers. So if you were around the grass lab in the 1990s, you might have seen this blimp floating around, maneuvering relative to spheres in the lab. Uh, we've also seen various results for servoing of quadrotor or quadrotor-like aerial vehicles, including a quadrotor, quadrotor that could even land on a moving target. But in many cases, these works are still, have, still have assumptions that we would like to avoid. And that is, they assume either that the system's first order still sometimes, or they might linearize the system, or they assume that the robot has velocity feedback from some external source, like the motion capture system. There's also been some recent development focused on manipulation that is, uh, well, manipulation, perching, as well as maneuvering relative to uh, more unique objects. For example, we've seen a helicopter that has a massive KUKA arm on it. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near this thing. Uh, we've seen robots that are able to inspect poles, vertical poles, robots that uh, can perch on lines, and even robots that can perch on rooftops. Now, the robots that can perch on rooftops wouldn't necessarily be useful for these types of persistent operations where we want the robot to be perched and maybe still perform some task, maybe a downwards observation or act as a radio relay, you now have occlusions because you have a building in the way. So these aren't exactly solving the problems that we want to solve. So we're interested in perching in locations uh, that would still allow for these types of downwards observation. And I think an ideal location uh, might be perching on cylinders, maybe light posts, tree branches, uh, power lines, hand railings, those sorts of objects, where the robot could perch from below and hang and still have a complete opportunity to view whatever it is or observe or uh, have an un unblocked path. DJ, you're not allowed to kick my stuff anymore. <laughs> Okay. Yes, I think I am. Okay. Uh, so, so one such possibility is to perch on tree branches, cylinders, and, and objects like light posts. Now, in order to approach this problem, we first need to be able to understand the relative pose between the object that we're perching on and the robot. And it turns out that we can model all of this with uh, some really handy tools where we can explore the projection of a cylinder onto the image. And it turns out to be two lines, not necessarily parallel, but with that information, we actually can get the, we can extract the relative pose between one image of a cylinder and uh, knowledge of its radius. Now, what separates this pretty significantly from traditional approaches in visual servoing literature is that the points that we're observing in the world are actually tangent to the cylinder. And in most cases, visual servoing assumes that the points in the world are fixed. But with the points that are tangent, as the robot moves, the points that we're observing in the world are also moving. The lines that we're observing in the world are also moving with the robot. Despite that, uh, we're still able to compute that relative pose and eventually simplify the system into a virtual image where we can define all of the parameters of the image 
uh, in this case, we simplify it to a situation where the cylinder is horizontal and modify or, and uh, defined by these three parameters, which we call image features. So row one, row two, and mu. Now they're related to the pose of the robot then, P, through a nonlinear relationship that we'll call gamma. Now with that information, we can then uh, compute a Jacobian and incorporate, or and actually compute accelerations of the vehicle in terms of those image features and the accelerations of those image features. We can incorporate this into our translational dynamics and express the dynamics of the vehicle in terms of the image features that we're actually observing. Now with that information, we can incorporate that into a control law, and actually we were able to prove that it is stable. Now, at the end of the day, we'd like to implement this on a robot. And so far, we've formulated the problem that the camera can actually be in any orientation. We're, we haven't restricted that. But on a real system, there are some clear advantages over certain design choices. So consider the case of a downwards facing camera maneuvering above a cylindrical object. If we want to be centered above the object, perhaps to perch on it, then the robot would actually have to rotate towards the right, which could cause the object to leave the field of view. On the other hand, if we consider an upwards facing camera for uh, a, when a robot is trying to perch on this, if the robot wanted to be centered, it would still rotate towards the right, but it is a much more natural motion uh, for keeping the object in the field of view. Now I should uh, mention that these aren't guarantees, but it goes to show that a, that a mechanical design that's well thought out can actually simplify some much larger problems that often exist. So we implemented this on our physical platform, and this robot uses only an onboard computer, an INU, an upwards facing camera, and the upwards facing gripper. We can demonstrate successful hovering and perching. We can vary the initial conditions. The control law doesn't care if the cylinder is inclined. It's completely arbitrary. And uh, despite that, we're able to still perch even in outdoor scenarios uh, using only feedback from the image and never actually uh, computing a pose, a relative pose. All right, so I'd like to take this one step further and consider objects that might be in motion. Maybe we'd have an adversarial drone, or maybe you simply want to keep playing fetch after your dog is tired. Now, I think this is a really interesting clip where we have aerial robots being caught by raptors. Well, why, what's, what's going, why are they doing this is really what I asked when I saw this. Well, th in this case, the Dutch National Police is actually trying to prepare for situations where aerial robots might be malicious or have malicious intents. Um, now this is really interesting, but it's obviously not going to scale well for larger robots. And it also won't scale well in terms of numbers. So it'd be great if we could have this type of capability uh, with our robots. Now to, to actually consider this, once again we need to figure out how to determine a relative pose. Well let's consider a slightly different geometry since we're not likely to have flying or maneuvering cylinders in the world. Let's consider a sphere where we can define its relative pose by C, a vector C, and then any vector that lies on the surface of the sphere we're going to define as X. This gives us a constraint that we can express that captures the surface of the sphere. Now we can choose any projection model that we want, maybe a, a flat planar model or a spherical model. Uh, really, it doesn't matter. But what, what we do have to say here is that we can assume that we can determine that projection based on the computation of a scalar lambda in this case. Now armed with that information, we can incorporate that projection model into the constraint for the sphere and expand. And what you see here is that this constraint is quadratic in lambda. Now the question is, what does that mean? That means that there are potentially two solutions for any vector x, any bearing vector that we observe in the image x. And these correspond to, in this case, two solutions for any bearing that goes through the sphere, for example, the close, the close surface as well as the far surface. There are a set of, set of solutions, however, in which there is only one, uh, one solution for lambda. 
And those are the ones that are tangent to the sphere. So in that case, this, this equation that I have here on the bottom, uh, in that case, that, the discriminant of that must actually vanish. And so we're left with a constraint that looks something like this, which is actually quadratic in our observation vector x, and is actually the general form for a conic. Now, if we assumed a spherical camera model for our system, we could actually express a minimization problem to solve for that vector c, which would tell us the relative pose based on a bunch of observations. Um, now, this isn't intuitive. Well, what is, is this diagram, perhaps, where I show that this constraint on the top is equivalent to minimizing the square of deviations from the Pythagorean constraint that exists from our vectors. So if we have the length of our vector c is denoted by gamma here, then the length of the vector that would actually intersect the surface of the sphere and be tangent would be expressed or captured by lambda. Then in that case, we're minimizing um, deviations from the Pythagorean constraint. We could then solve this using a gradient descent method um, and, and actually compute that c that way. An alternative approach is to minimize the so-called algebraic error, error, where we could express the conic constraint as linear in terms of our unknown matrix A, and we can then stack our observations into a large matrix. And since, since our constraint is such that A can be scaled arbitrarily, we can impose a unit norm for the matrix A, and then solve it using singular value decomposition. Once we've done that, we can perform another decomposition to extract the axis of the cone, as well as the range to the sphere. So here I have an image with the simulated image boundary given by the purple frame. And I have three methods plotted. And the detected boundary points of the sphere are denoted by these the red points on the edge. And the centroid of those points is the star. The geometric method that I just discussed is the blue diamond. And the algebraic solution is the green square. Now, each of these methods also has their pros and cons. First of all, the centroid method, uh, in this case, I'm looking at just the centroid of the boundary points. But in some cases, uh, researchers will consider the centroid of all of the points that are observed. But in either case, the centroid method can provide a potentially very poor fit, especially when, for example, the sphere is off the edge of the image. The geometric solution provides the best squit, the, I'm sorry, the best fit in the least square sense, but it's also the slowest method because it's a nonlinear approach. And the algebraic solution provides a much better fit than the centroid, but uh, it also has the benefit that it's actually fast enough for real-time situations. So now that we can compute a relative pose, it's advantageous to actually consider the relative dynamics of our system. So if we express them in the robot frame, we have on the left-hand side the acceleration of the object relative to the robot. We have terms that, in, that result from the rotation of the vehicle. And we also have terms that we've seen before, such as the gravity compensation, as well as the thrust of the vehicle. Now, these dynamics include the robot's angular dynamics, which ends up creating some additional couplings between the translational dynamics and the angular dynamics, which means that our system would no longer be differentially flat, which would make challenging, or which would make planning a, a much larger challenge for our system. Now, what we've done in the past is assume that these angular dynamics don't exist in this case, or we effectively align our frame with the world frame in orientation but fix it in translation with the vehicle. And what this allows us to do is simplify the dynamics to something of this form, where all of these angular terms drop out. Now, in this case, we still have a term that includes the acceleration of the object in the world frame. Now, if we knew something about the dynamics of the object in the world frame, we could substitute this here. Uh, but under, and under certain situations, it might actually be a differentially flat system enabling the planning methods that we've used before. Uh, one such possibility, and this is perhaps the easiest one, is to assume that the target is a constant velocity target, in which case the acceleration is zero, and we end up with the dynamics that I pictured here. 
Now these should look familiar because we've seen almost exactly the same thing before. We saw this when we were looking at the dynamics of the robot in the world frame. It's some sign differences, but effectively the same thing. And why is that? That's because we just assumed that the fixed velocity target, or that the target is fixed velocity, which means that it's also an inertial frame. Which is interesting because then that allows us to express our control directly relative to the target because it is an inertial frame. So we could choose our control law to be expressed in the world or uh, in the frame of our target. So now we'd like to be able to plan a trajectory for this system. So I'm going to use the convention here where we have a polynomial P of T for a single dimension. We can express it as a summation of coefficients and basis elements or as a coefficient vector multiplied by a basis vector. We can choose really any basis that we want for our system, uh, but I pictured here a power basis uh, that is certainly a valid option for these types of approaches. Now this generalizes pretty easily to multiple dimensions where we can make what I'm calling a basis matrix, which actually has staggered basis vectors on the rows. And then we can stack our coefficient vectors in one vector that I will call C. So this would generalize for D dimensions, for example. Now this notation isn't the most clear, so it's actually equivalent to the notation I've listed here, which is just those coefficient vectors on the rows and a single basis vector. But the notation on the top is actually much more useful later, and we'll see that emerge. So equipped with this notation, we can actually define a path for the, for the vehicle, the robot, as P of T, uh, which is a function of that basis matrix and our coefficient vector C. We can also define a target trajectory, G of T, that considers that basis matrix and a vector of coefficients h. Now let's assume that the target trajectory is known or that we can estimate it or maybe that we can predict it. In that case, we're still left with the question of what robot trajectory do we execute or plan in order to intercept or interact with our target? To answer this question, we can learn something from the dragonfly. These insects have pretty simple eyes. Uh, but they're really impressive in some aspects. So their field of view can see almost entirely the, the whole way around the dragonfly, except for almost directly behind. Uh, but the baseline of their eyes is so small that their vision is effectively monocular vision. Now despite this, dragonflies are incredibly successful hunters. Some species are able to capture fruit flies at over a 95% success rate. That's basically an A+. So how do they do this? Well, many insects track their targets. That means they fly directly towards their target at any point in time. Dragonflies, on the other hand, intercept their targets. They're not concerned with flying directly towards their target. They're concerned with flying in a path that gets them to their target as quickly as possible. Now, one thing that's interesting about this behavior is that it, what it means is that the bearing from the dragonfly to the fruit fly, for example, is a constant bearing in the dragonfly's frame. And what this effectively means is that the dragonfly has minimized the velocity between the, or matched the velocity actually, between the dragonfly itself and, uh, and the target in the plane that is perpendicular to the bearing that's observed. All right, so you gotta see this video. This is really cool. Fruit fly comes in from the left-hand side Dragonfly waits for a second, presumably to estimate a range. Now you'll see how, how linear this trajectory is. I've drawn a line there so you can compare. At the end, the fruit fly is turning to the right, and the dragonfly is still able to compensate for that. Really, really impressive. So why don't we have our robots do the same thing? All right, so I've assumed already that the path of the target is known or can be estimated. And what's, what has been done in the past uh, in this domain of research is uh, a minimization of the position error. And I think many of you have seen Frank's uh, talk on this, where a robot was able to minimize the position error between itself and a target and track the target through a cluttered environment. However, I think that approach is not applicable in all scenarios. For example, we want to consider situations where the target might enter the field of view and leave very quickly. Now in those cases, um, for example, if we have a target on the left-hand side of the robot moving towards the right, 
and we minimize the position error, we might end up with a trajectory that results in something like this, where the robot initially moves to the left before it begins to accelerate to the right. Well, that won't work well in really aggressive situations where we would prefer that the robot directly moves in the direction of motion of the target. So instead what we can do is minimize the velocity error, which is very similar to the approach that the dragonfly takes. In those cases, the robot would initially move towards the right, which is the direction that we actually would need it to move in these types of quick scenarios. So we needed to express this or capture this uh, in a general form. So let's define our error between the trajectories as, as the difference between the, the target trajectory and the robot trajectory. And then what we'd like to do is minimize the Euclidean error over some time horizon for our system. So this is integrating that Euclidean error uh, for the rth derivative, if you will, uh, over our horizon. Now if we expand, this is actually quadratic in terms of our coefficient vector c and our coefficient vector h. And you see here that these qr matrices appear, and qr is simply the outer product of that basis matrix that we defined earlier. Now, what's kind of nice about this is that if we assume a constant horizon, or if we non-dimensionalize the time, then QR can be pre-computed for any of, our or any of our derivatives. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the constraints that we face uh, for our system. So first, we have dynamic constraints. That is that the relative degree of our system is high and that requires and dictates that any trajectories that we plan are at least four times differentiable. We also have actuator constraints. For example, we have a maximum thrust. We have maximum angular accelerations that result from the limitations of our motors. We have constraints based on the sensors. Our gyros saturate at some point, which dictates a maximum angular velocity. And we also have constraints uh, such as the field of view of our camera, which we'd now like to actually consider in our planning problem. Now, to give you an idea of what these look like, uh, this is a cross-section of our 3D system. So everything is in 3D, but this is just to visualize it. This is the XZ plane of the acceleration. The thrust constraint manifests itself as, in this case, a circle, but really a sphere in 3D that's centered at negative G because that's the point when there's actually zero thrust. We also have constraints, uh, oh, I should mention before I Yes, so the orientation of the vehicle is also defined by the vector, the acceleration vector. So at any given time, we know the orientation based on where our vector lies in this. And that motivates us to impose certain constraints like this one, where we would want, the, want to avoid situations where the robot becomes inverted or actually avoid a singularity that exists in the diffeomorphism between the flat space and the robot state space. Now, uh, we'd like to, uh, the field of view constraint is also able to be captured by acceleration constraints. So if we consider a, a target that's pictured here, um, the accelerations that would maintain the object in the field of view are defined by the axis or the bearing between the target and the robot. So we can rotate these nominal field of view constraints into this new frame uh, and express those constraints as accelerations. So I just want to recap quickly that when the relative velocity between the, the vehicle and um, the target is zero, then the bearing that we're observing for the target is stationary. And this is very similar to the strategy taken by dragonflies. We're able to formulate this, uh, this problem as an optimization problem that's quadratic. However, it has nonlinear constraints. And in general, these types of problems we wouldn't be able to solve quickly enough for a real-time solution before the robot would need to move uh, in situations where the object might have left the field of view within a second. One way that's typically used to solve these problems is sequential quadratic program, where uh, the solver iterates uh, with a, an approximation of the, uh, of the problem, uh, but with linear constraints. And so we actually incorporate that, incorporate that into our planner, planner uh, and into our receding horizon approach. However, 
uh, I should mention that this approach is not complete, as is the case uh, for most nonlinear problems like this, uh, as well as receding horizon approaches. Now, in the ideal case, we would have results that look like this, where I have the robot denoted by this blue flat line at the top and his field of view given by the shaded blue region. So in a second, you'll see the robot enter the field of view and you'll see some interesting behaviors emerge. For example, the robot actually, when it's detected, the robot begins to move slightly upwards, which is a direct result of the field of view constraint that we've placed on our vehicle. Now we can incorporate this into a dynamic simulator to actually consider actuator constraints uh, as well as have a controller that's closing the loop here. I'd like to thank Jake for his help with this because he was very helpful. Um, so at the bottom I have pictured a third person view. We have a simulated image from the vehicle on the top right. And you can see that the object never leaves the field of view. On the top we have the position errors ex uh, expressed in the world frame. Now here's a slowed down version of what, our, of what the planner looks like. On the vertical axis I have the velocities and each dashed line is the trajectory for one of the dimensions of the robot. The target trajectories are the solid lines and it's modeled as a constant velocity. So initially we're minimizing just the velocity error, but after this vertical black line, we then can conclude that it's actually appropriate to also minimize the position error. And those are the situations where the target is now leaving from the center of the field of view. Now here's a simulated result of that scenario where we have the third person view on the bottom as well as the image on the top and the target is coming from a different direction and you see that even in this case we have convergence there. And I also mentioned earlier the possibility of intercepting aerial vehicles. Um, so I'm presenting this example to show you that this approach generalizes very well to three dimensions where we might have a vehicle that's not necessarily moving in the ground plane anymore. All right, so to recap everything we've talked about, we started with some preliminaries of aerial robotics. We incorporated manipulation and explored that overlap. And finally, we've been incorporating perception and using that to drive planning and control algorithms for our vehicles. The specific tasks that we've addressed have included high-speed grasping, perching on smooth and vertical surfaces, as well as vision-based perching on cylinders, and finally, the consideration of moving targets. I think there are many opportunities for future work. Uh, for example, we could generalize the high-speed grasping to consider the full three-dimensional case. We could explore recovery strategies for failed perch attempts on these vertical surfaces. We could also uh, consider more general objects for visual servoing, not just spheres and cylinders, but really any object. We could also uh, compare image-based methods with these vision based or the image based methods with the position based methods and try to have a better understanding as to which one is better in which scenarios uh, practically speaking. And I think uh, a really important area to consider is the online estimation of the scale of the situation of the target as well as its velocity and kind of along the same lines is an understanding of the sensitivity of our system of our control laws to those scale and velocity estimates. All right, and with that, I'd like to thank VJ. Uh, you've been a fantastic advisor, and I really could not have asked uh, for better. I'd also like to thank my committee, CJ Taylor, Kostas Danielidis, and Kostas Serenith, who is joining us remotely. I'm also grateful for the meme department, the university, uh, and the many funding sources that have supported me through the years. And I'd like to thank all of you for making my time here incredibly enjoyable. I've had a great experience. So thank you again, VJ, for the academic, the intellectual. That was not Starbucks, by the way, for those of you who know me. Um, the, the academic, the intellectual, the travel, and the social opportunities, VJ. Uh, thanks for those. Um, I'd also like to thank Giuseppe for not being afraid to try new ideas and to just see if it works, and for being my uh, personal international tour guide. I'm also proud to call Denise, who just defended uh, two days ago. Great job. Uh, I'm proud to call her my academic twin and uh, to be partners in crime, coffee, and classes. <laughs>
And I was blessed to enter the PhD program with an awesome crew of st students from the meme department. Uh, you guys are awesome, and I'm excited to see where you guys go in the future. And I also like to credit, uh, I've had some really great collaborators from Stanford University, the University of Maryland, as well as the Czech Technical University. And uh, I've had a wonderful opportunity to work with some really excellent undergraduate students. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my family uh, and my girlfriend, Corey. You guys have been very supportive of my journey through many, many years of schooling uh, that, and help with robots, for example. <laughs> So uh, now I'd like to open up the floor for any additional questions. Thank you. Uh, the first question I have is, uh, so you talked about visual tooling. You mentioned two disadvantages to both approaches the uh, Azure plus other language, mm -hmm. the Azure full activity. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're, when you're looking at uh, moving objects, now, is there an assumption that your camera plane and the ground plane are along the same axis? Do you end up with a model that has the same? of the system with the moving target uh, so it doesn't actually end up being a first order system it is uh, it is still a higher order system uh, no so in the dynamic constraints that consider the actuation are actually incorporated in the planning strategy and require that the because the trajectories are required to be sufficiently smooth um, between like the trajectories of the robot relative to the target so that still captures those dynamic constraints that exist we've only assumed that the target is moving at a constant velocity in the world okay. uh, my second question is about the field of view constraints so this is what the constraints are called Yes, that is correct. So we. Uh, no, I am doing receding horizon, uh, but in the planner, not in the controller. Uh, so I've been able to solve four trajectories at usually 50 milliseconds on a computer using a uh, Garobi optimizer. So that's one, one iteration I should mention. Okay, so uh, that's it for me. Sure. So uh, the question is, if our approaching strategies would still work if we assume that the radius of the cylinder was unknown. And um, I have actually some experimental results that can attest to that. Uh, one time I accidentally set the radius as the diameter. So, uh, and yes, we were still able to perch. Uh, what it effectively does is it changes the gains that the system uses. Uh, and so um, really it's, it, can still be provably stable, but the issue arises in that you end up hitting actuator constraints that you wouldn't hit otherwise. 
the, the geometric approach or the algebraic approach? The geometric approach is taking the errors from the Pythagorean constraint. I can go back to the slide if you'd like. Um, but it's taking those errors and minimizing the summation of the square of those errors for all of the points. So it would be the it would be minimizing the square in, in that sense. Correct, correct. Which I think is something that we could also consider um, in the fitting. Uh, so if we know that the projection of the sphere, uh, if you don't mind if I elaborate, if we know that the projection of the sphere uh, in our system, we know that we're dealing with the sphere, then the projection onto a flat plane we can prove is an ellipse. And with that knowledge, instead of fitting, simply fitting the algebraic errors um, in order to determine the conic, we could actually fit an ellipse first. And from that ellipse, we would actually be able to determine the matrix A that defines that conic. Right. So really, it's the same. Um, I just chose to put that more with the norm material uh, because it ends up being a very similar approach for the, old, for the previous conditions, but the newer, newer approach is an even more constrained situation. Yes. So if you don't have field of view constraints, then the optimization problem um, technically would still be non, would have nonlinear constraints that result from uh, the actuator constraints, for example. Uh, but in many cases, those can be assumed to be linear or they can be linearized in these situations. Um, so the problem would simplify greatly though because you could eliminate those field of view constraints. And um, in the cases where the robot was ascending before it actually matched the velocity, you wouldn't see that sort of behavior with a larger, larger field of view camera. That's a great question. So the question is, if you were to track or consider a sphere with a purely image-based approach. Um, there are actually some interesting works that dive into that topic. And they propose a set of coordinates that effectively end up being the bearing and the range to the cylinder. So it ends up being very similar to the position-based approach. Uh, in fact, it, there's a unique mapping between the two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So let me make sure I understand what your thought process is here. An alternative formulation for the image based approach that um, that considers more of an approach that might be similar to the dragonflies where where which aspect? Okay. Right. 
Right. Right. So I think. Uh, yeah. So that's a really interesting um, point, and that is, if you so say you could match or minimize the velocity of the bearing, so you could integrate your motions to figure out what the velocity of the of the target object is. If you don't have a sense of the scale, then what you can do is fly along the direction of the bearing once you've matched that velocity. Um, and there are methods that look at that. For example, the way that outfielders, human outfielders catch, uh, catch balls, they're looking at the rate of change of the object in the image. And based on that information, they can actually predict when collision would occur. And um, these are called general tau theory methods or time to collision approaches. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that may be present with dragonflies. Um, some people speculate that the dragonflies are actually estimating the scale before they even leave their perch location. Um, and in that case, then they actually would have an estimate of the scale, which would give them an estimate of the velocity. But it's still an open area of research for dragonflies. Um, but I think on the vehicles, there's a lot of opportunity for consideration uh, or el completely eliminating the requirement to know the scale. Right. So with a really wide, wide field of view camera, um, the, the paths end up not being significantly different. Um, it really depends on how fast the object is moving. So with a wider field of view camera, you could actually capture a much faster moving object. Oh, okay. 